Well, good evening. It's sure good to see all of you tonight. Happy for another opportunity to share some study from God's Word and in this evening's lesson from uh, Nature Round About Us to look at design in nature, some of the arguments for creation. Uh, unfortunately, our children are oftentimes locked in schools and go to universities where you're only able to hear one side of the evidence in the debate about creation or evolution. And we have, of course, television shows that fill the airways with uh, arguments by those that have an atheistic uh, attitude towards the world around us and believe in, uh, you know, a naturalistic uh, explanation for everything in the world around us. But there's much evidence everywhere about us, uh, more than can fill any book. <laughs> We have much more than a library of books uh, in just about every part of nature and all living things to show the creative design and power of God and the great intelligence behind all the things that we see. There are a lot of fascinating uh, things in the world of creation that surround us. Uh, cheetahs can run 70 miles per hour. I can remember uh, when I used to ride my bike a whole lot uh, for exercise. I mean, going 30, 35, you're moving it big time. <laughs> but 70 miles an hour, a cat that can run that fast. Insects that sleep 17 years in the earth and then come out. Amazing creatures. Uh, there's seals that haul their breath for 45 minutes and dive 1,500 feet deep in order to get their food. Octopuses that uh, shoot ink. They can eat their arms and grow new ones. You've got archer fish, uh, shoots water 15 feet to down a bug that's flying overhead. Uh, peregrine hawks that swoop at 150 miles per hour. Um, ecological relationships between organisms and their environment that are perfectly uh, fit one another and certainly show all kinds of evidence that they were designed to be just that way. They all point to intelligent design and forethought and planning of our great creator, of course, that made all of us and uh, that created mankind and worked and created the spirits that are in us and that one day we're going to give account to. This uh, teleological argument for God uh, is one that's based on purpose and design. We can see it in the heavens above as we look at you know, the perfect place that the earth is located and all the perfect things about the solar system and the universe itself to produce life here on earth or to support it. Well, the same thing is true in all of biology around us. George Gallup says, take the human body alone. The chance that all the functions of the individual could just happen is a statistical monstrosity. And really, you can take every individual organ in the body every human cell, and make the same kind of arguments, that they just couldn't accidentally happen. They're way too complex, and everything uh, has a certain irreducible complexity about it that shows that all of the parts were designed and shaped by God. One that is often used in the, in the origin of the species that Darwin mentioned that as a great problem for evolutionists is the eye. And we know so much more about the eye than when he wrote his book that started off this whole thing about evolution. Uh, you think about the human eye and the complexity of it, and you can't even begin to draw it all on these charts about how complex the eye is. It has auto-aiming, focusing, aperture, adjustment. Just amazing the things that the eye can do in comparison to cameras that you try to buy. Uh, we're able to, you know, function in almost complete darkness. If you, you stay out at night for a certain period of time, you can see almost as good as an owl can see. And then you can step out in the bright sunlight and deal with that as well and be able to see. We can focus on a tiny hair, uh, make 100,000 separate motions with our eyes. And everybody has two of these wonderful things that's in our head. And they're able to focus together on a single point 
uh, to a degree, like a marksman shooting at a target with one pistol and then being able to shoot with the other and hit exactly the same spot. Our eyes do that all the time. And they're able to focus. It all shows incredible design. It's a living camera that we have uh, that's in our heads. And the cornea is about four times more powerful out here on the outside of the eye to protect it, more powerful than the lens and bringing light into focus, the thin covering over the front of the eye. The iris, the colorful part of the center of the eye, has uh, two muscles that work together to open and close uh, the pupil. Uh, together they open and close the iris diaphragm. The pupil controls the amount of light let into the eye. And the two sets of muscles in the iris control the size of the pupil. Again, you think about, you know, it doesn't take much to overwhelm cameras with being too bright. You just get nothing on your picture or being too dark. We can step from a dark room outside and our eyes adjust immediately to whatever we're looking at. We can look at that tiny hair or we can look at the moon or a star off however many light years that is away. We can focus immediately on those two things. Think about all the twisting you'd have to do on a camera to get it all focused in. And it all happens at once. The lens is flexible like rubber and can quickly focus by changing its shape so that we can zero in on things. All of that accidentally happened just by time and chance. All of these individual parts that make up the eye. Or is there not an all-knowing God, a super designer that designed the eye? Certainly the evidence points in that direction for the eye. When you think about the movements of the eye, we have six muscles on each of our eyes, 12 muscles all together that work in coordination when you're looking at things and focusing upon things to move them up and down and sideways and around. Uh, and a new thing that I was reading about today that I hadn't heard about before is that we have micro tremors in our eyes that are going on all the time that uh, one one thousandth of a millimeter or we're making these little circles is every time we look at something and it goes on constantly if our eyes stop and they've done experiments to make your eyes stop everything would just go gray only the only thing you would see is if somebody smiled or there was some movement you'd see it for an instant and then it would fade away. You had to have that movement for the cells in your eyes to see things. And uh, that's an amazing thing to think about the design involved in that and how much is going on. It says that this is a thing going on 30 to 70 times a second. You see a chart like this with all these little lines and you stare at that and you'll see that your eyes are doing that. It, those lines won't stay still because your eyes are circling like this constantly in order to get the focus and to be able to get the light and be able to to see what kind of computer you know did God build into us to control all of that so that we've got this perfect vision wherever we look the Almighty God and all wise God it, it's in every part of our body these things are seen constant maintenance is carried on in the eye. We have these glands above our eye to bring out the tears, to cover our eyes with that film of water because our eyes aren't perfectly smooth for us to look through. So we have that constant moisture that's there that smooths it out. Then uh, the puncta, I guess is how you say that word for the tear duct that's in the corner of your eye to drain the water out constantly into your nose and is constantly working so that your eyes are kept clean all the time. Then when you go to sleep at night, there's still the process going on to take care of this perfect cameras that you've got so that you can see. Uh, they function as a whole. If one of these parts didn't work right, none of it would work, right? So you can't evolve just uh, the, the explanation Darwin would give. Well, you evolve this one little part and then this other little part, and then eventually they all kind of, They've all got to work together at the same time or it's useless. You're blind. You can't see without all the parts working. So it shows there's design involved in these things. To complicate it even more for evolutionists, 
there's parallel evolution uh, in the sense that there are different kind of eyes and different kind of creatures uh, that God has made in his uh, wisdom and in his uh, desire for, you know, variety that he has and beauty. He makes it in different ways, squid and vertebrae and anthropods. They have different kinds of eyes that function in different ways. In Psalms 94 and verse 9, he who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? Certainly he does see this great wise God that created all these things and left his fingerprints everywhere around us, in us and without. Where did the eye come from in the first place? Evolutionists have no explanation for that. They try to line up things like it started off this way and then it gradually became that. You know, we could put up a tractor and a car and an airplane and we can line them all up. That doesn't mean they evolved from each other, does it? No, where did it come from in the first place? What adds more information to increase complexity from one kind of eye to the next? We've seen mutation takes away information. So where do you get to add more and more information in to end up with the kind of eyes we have? There's not an explanation for that. Except creation. God designed it that way from the beginning. Macroevolution requires the addition of new information. And we don't, we don't have a source for that new information that has been found. Look at the woodpecker. This is a, uh, you think about how this could evolve. You know, a little part at a time, a woodpecker. He lives by banging his head against a tree. Now, what was the first bird that ever thought about doing that? Said, I'm going to bang my head into this tree, and I might find something in there. Right? Is that what happened? Is that the way it worked? Whatever gave it that idea, it's got a thick skull and shock-absorbing tissue like no other bird that protects it when it starts drilling into that tree. It's got to have a special kind of beak to do that. What if it hatched out and it had the cushion in its frame, but it didn't have the right beak? It would, it would just crumple up. That would have been the end of that. If it didn't have the cushion, it would have knocked its brains out the first time it tried. You see the problem? that You have to have all of the things together for it to work. You can't evolve it one little step at a time and have it work. Then the bug gets away and it gets down in the tree. How's he going to get the bug out? He's got a tongue that's super long that he can shoot in there. But can you see this thing flying around with this giant tongue that's like hanging out of its mouth that can shoot way down in the tree? It get it hung on everything, right, and crash. So it's got a, a sleeve of muscle, and it wraps this tongue underneath the skin and around and into its nostril. How long did it take to figure that out, right? That had to be created all together. You needed this place to put the tongue. And God made it that way. So he wraps his tongue under the skin and brings it around and into part of his nostril. And this is all, you can look all this up on the internet. It's all, look up a woodpecker. It'll tell you all about these things. There's complex traits there that work together to make this bird survivable. And it makes it function the way that it does. And there, there's an irreducible complexity. You leave part of it out and it won't work. Right? It's all got to be there together, just like a mouse trap. There's, there's just a, you get to a certain level in the complexity of that thing, and it, for it to work to catch a mouse. And if you leave any parts out, it won't work. Traits that depend on one another, uh, for any function to have any value to it. Otherwise, what good would these qualities have been to the woodpecker before they all came together? They would have been a detriment. Nerves and muscle coordination. If he doesn't hit the tree exactly right, he breaks his neck. Right? So he's got to have extra strong uh, tendons and he's got to have accuracy when he's doing that. The eyelids snap shut when the beak strikes its target. It keeps wood chips out, it's what some biologists say. Others say it keeps his eyeballs from popping out of his head when he's hitting the tree so hard. Probably both are true. He probably needs it that way. He's got some special 
fuzz inside his nostrils that help protect him from the wood. And uh, just go on and on with this particular creature. Thick bill, skull, shock absorber, tissue, long tongue. Got to have it all together. You just have one of those things, it wouldn't be any good. A sea slug. Here's another wonder of God's creation. He lives along the seashore in tidal zones. He feeds on sea anemones. Uh, they have stinging cells in them, and he eats them, which, I mean, they would kill anything else. But he has the ability to eat them and keep the stinging cells together and to be able to pass them through his body with these little hairs and then store them for his own defense. Now, how in the world did that ever evolve? Can you imagine the first time he tried it and it, the stinging cell killed him? I mean, how many times did he have to try that before it worked? And then to have the specially adapted system to move these along and store them in his digestive system and then use them for defense. And these anemones, they don't have any kind of uh, defense against this. They're, they're not able to defend themselves like they are against other creatures. It's obviously something, that, again, that has a uh, special design made by God in order to do these things. In Psalms 135 and verse 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, and in the seas, and in all depths. God is able to create these animals this way. That's the way, the reason they are perfectly adapted for what they do. There's design, it's not a big accident that it happened. Garden ants, this is an interesting uh, symbiosis that happens where you have two different types of living things that need one another in order to survive. And you think, well, what came first? <laughs> you know, how, was the ant first or the tree first? Because the tree can't live without the ant, and the ant lives off the tree. They go together. Uh, it's called a bull's horn acacia tree. And you can see it looks just like a bull's horn, the thorns that are on this. They're hollow, and they have a hole in them just so ants can crawl in there and protect the tree. They have large hollow horns. The, the ants, this gardening ant, lives inside the horns for shelter, for protection. It has a very ferocious sting to keep predators away from the tree. The tree supplies little bumps that grow out for these ants to eat and survive on. And the ants destroy all the vegetation around the tree in the jungle so that it gets plenty of sunlight. And they've taken these ants away from the tree to see what happens, and the tree dies within 2 to 15 months. So the tree absolutely needs the ant to live. How in the world did that get started? Unless God designed it that way. We have a God that's uh, wonderfully wise, endless variety of design and beauty for all of us to enjoy, and he's made all of these things to show his glory to us. In Proverbs 30 and verse 25, the ants are not a strong people, but they prepare their food in the summer. He wants us studying these ants and learning things from them. In Proverbs 6, 6, go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways and be wise. Cleaning symbiosis. Here's a good one to try to figure out how in the world did this ever evolve. Creation, we can see that it creation would work. You have this large fish that eats little fish and shrimp. But he goes to a cleaning station and he opens his mouth and this special little shrimp and little fish come and clean all of the parasites off of it. Off of his teeth, he opens his gills and lets them swim inside and clean his gills out. And here's the marvel that when they finish cleaning him, he doesn't eat them, right? He just swims off and goes and eats some other shrimp and other fish somewhere else. But he has this symbiosis with them. They no, he's not going to eat them. Can you see the problem for the first shrimp that tried to be the cleaner? He's like, swims in, and I'm going to clean your fish. That's the end of that whole symbiosis, right? The first time he doesn't get out, I mean, who's going to do that again? But it's been set up. They've been programmed by God to do these particular functions. They obviously work together. It's not just limited to fish. Uh, the miles... Uh, Plufer, I think is how you pronounce that word, 
uh, cleans the teeth of the crocodile. How does that work? I mean, I'm not going to stick my hand in there, right? I mean, we've seen, I've seen that on video where somebody's, you know, doing one of the animal shows and they clops down on their anything touches that alligator on the inside of his mouth, he bites it. But this particular bird cleans all of the stuff in his teeth, cleans between his teeth, and he won't eat it. <laughs> Who was the first bird to crawl in there and try that, right? And you had to evolve it at the same time, right? If it evolved, the, you'd have to get the bird evolved to think, and that's a good idea to, to be useful. And you'd have to have the alligator, he'd have to evolve at the same time not to eat you, right? They'd have to do it together. What are the odds of that happening? Psalms 36 and verse 6 says, Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like a great deep. O oh Lord, you preserve man and beast. Yeah, God works out where all of these things are able to survive. And there is this great complex web in biology that keeps this whole system working. With one animal living off another, working together with another, so that it all works together in God's wisdom. Here's one of my favorite, the beetle warfare, the bombardier beetle. How about this for evolving? He is able to blast out this liquid when a frog is coming to try to eat him. He shoots this liquid at the frog. It's 212 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's temperature of boiling water that comes out. It's a chemical reaction. It comes out of two pipes that mix two chemicals together and make this explosion. The reason it's called the bombardier beetle. It mixes dangerous chemicals together. Hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide are mixed together. It adds an inhibitor while it's inside its body so that it doesn't blow up, become unstable. But at the nozzle where it adds the two together, it has another chemical that strips the inhibitor off and makes it blow up. Can you imagine you just evolved that a little bit at a time like this little cartoon down here? Like, boom, didn't get it mixed right, right? Well, that's no way to evolve. <laughs> We've got to try it again, you know, until we get the mixture right. Is that what happened? That doesn't make any sense. How did it ever get, get started a little bit at a time? You have to have the whole system evolve for it to work. See the scientific drawing from a science book? you got one tube here, one tube there. Then they mix together down here in the nozzle. That looks like design to me. It looks like somebody worked that all out, just like we mix different gases and things together um, in order to cause a reaction in a bomb or whatever we're trying to use. You couldn't do that piecemeal. That shows evidence of design. In Genesis 125, God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the earth after its kind. And God saw that it was good. He made it good. He made it where it works and shows his glory. There's another beetle, a water beetle. And of course, they use uh, the surface tension of water in order to be able to run across the water. And it's a, a strange quality that water has. Reading about that this week, and I was watching the up in the space station. There was somebody sent an experiment up to the astronauts, and he took a, a wet paper towel and started, you know, wringing it out in space where there's no gravity and the water just goes up over his hand and the surface tension he's just got like a gel over his hands because of the surface tension of the water it doesn't just float out or anything it all holds together well this bug knows how to use that he, he can hunt on the water but if something gets after him he can shoot out this detergent that causes whatever's chasing him to sink and break the surface tension how did he ever come up with that must have been designed by God as a defense for that particular beetle, that he's able to do that. Our Lord, how many are your works, the psalmist says. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. In Psalm 119, verse 73, your hands made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn 
your commandments. We need to learn that there is an almighty God that created all things and that put all of this wisdom and this design into animals. What about migratory instincts? You know, all of us, we've got our uh, GPS and maps and we still get lost, right? I mean, trying to go, well, I do. We still, uh, you know, end up in the wrong place sometimes. Well, what if you're a little bird brain? How are you going to navigate all over the world? Unless somebody programmed it into you how to do it. Some of these birds know how to migrate and their parents aren't even around. They do it on their own. First time they're able to get where they're going. Somebody put that in their head, don't you think? The lesser white-throated wobbler. He uh, summers in Germany. He's got his area up here and flies all the way down into Africa. The adults leave Africa several weeks before the young, and they're still able to navigate their way to Africa. So you can't say, well, they just watched their parents do it, and they learn how. No, it doesn't work that way. They have within their brains the inherent knowledge of how to tell latitude, longitude, and direction by the stars plus a calendar, a clock, and all necessary navigational data. I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. But the bird knows how to do it. Who taught that bird? In Psalms 50 and verse 11, I know every bird of the mountains. And everything that moves in the field is mine, God says. I made the birds. I taught them how to survive. I feed these birds. And if he cares for these birds, Jesus said, how much more does he care for us? We're of much more value than a bird. He certainly cares about us. It's not just one bird that does this, but many, many different kinds of birds. This, uh, the golden pluver, he travels 8,000 miles south from Hudson Bay region across 2,000 miles over the sea from Nova Scotia to the Caribbean countries and winters in Argentina every year. Imagine. He returns through Central America and the Mississippi Valley. The barn swallow goes 9,000 miles from northern Canada to Argentina. And here's the champion of them all. The Arctic tern migrates 14,000 miles each year from pole to pole. Think about that. That... That's the champion of all flyers there, to fly all that distance and then turn around and go the other way. When you get through 7,000 miles each direction. But again, it's not just birds that God has built this into. Whales, here's my migration of whales in different pods of whales around the world and where they go back and forth from summer to winter and to feed and to mate. You have uh, fur seals uh, that do the same thing. I think this map over here is uh, the salmon out in Oregon and Washington and the route that they take and then come back to the place where they spawn. Uh, turtles, they're pretty, pretty impressive. I think about searching for Nemo <laughs> where he gets with the turtles. Well, they go all the way across the Pacific Ocean and back in their migration. That's, that's impressive. How, who taught them how to do that? They end up in the right spot when they got there. I don't think a reptiles is really super intelligent to you, but they've got all of that programming in there to be able to carry that out. Uh, here's some of the bats and where they migrate to throughout the year. Yeah. Uh, here, this is the first. These are the first seals, where they go. We could just go on and on with these uh, evidences of design that God has worked into nature. These abilities, one writer said, evolve. Uh, could they have evolved piecemeal through mere chance processes, or were they placed in the animal by a direct intelligence? And again, they're useless unless they're perfect. If you're that Arctic turn and you don't get the navigation right. You're going to crash out in the ocean, right? You'd be a dead bird. Your species is over. But you got to get it exactly right. The migration's got to work every time or got to work from the beginning. And it does work to perfection. 
The navigation halfway across the ocean is worthless. Serves the purpose of preserving thousands of animals that God has built this into their brains that they're able to do this. These animals were carefully created and designed with these impressive abilities enabled them to lead enjoyable and successful life generation after generation. So all around, nature is crying out that there is a creator just like the one the Bible describes to us and reveals to us. There's another book of nature that's telling us the same message and giving us the same story. If we've got eyes to see and ears to hear. What about insect flight? You talk about bird flight, that's pretty amazing. But think about all the different thousands upon thousands of animals or insects that can fly and the different ways in which they all fly. All kinds of winged insects that God made all at once, teeming in the sky. And these are superbly designed. We have people that are studying these and trying to figure out little robots and drones and stuff that will work just like these insects do, trying to use our intelligence to design something, trying to imitate what God has already done. There's a variety of movements. Some of them use rowing in order to to elevate and, and depression, they, they can go fore and aft movements, pronation, superpanation, changes in shape by folding and buckling. I mean, every different conceivable way you can think of something could fly. God has programmed that into different insects. Uh, they can hover, they can fly backwards, they can fly sideways, they can rotate. Again, you can just focus in on one particular kind of insect and, and study the rest of your life on all of this stuff on how they operate. Uh, some fly, fly with small wings by beating them really fast. Some of them have big wings that they can beat slow. A beetle beats its wings 50, 50, 55 beats per second. That's moving in order for him to take off and fly across the room. Think about a June bug flying around, what he's got to do to fly. Uh, insect is truly an engineering wonder, which displays God's glory, power, and wisdom. A honeybee, 200 times per second, or 200, 200 times per second in a minute, he beats his wings. Well, I don't remember my numbers there. Exactly, 146 per second. Anyway, I don't know if I wrote that down right, but anyway, look it up. <laughs> You'll be amazed. Uh, in Ro Romans 1 and verse 20, the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood what has been made so that they are without excuse. People are without excuse for ignoring the Creator. Every, everything inside and outside of each of us is telling us there was an uh, all-wise designer that was involved in this world that's all around us. Well, I think I'll stop there and maybe save some of these other points for another lesson, maybe next month. Just the whole idea of visual beauty. When an evolutionist speaks about something being useful for survival, why is everything so pretty, right? Why does it have to be pretty? We know God's beautiful and he makes things beautiful and he makes us so we can appreciate beauty. But what's its evolutionary purpose to be beautiful? Some things you can't even see unless you go down to the bottom of the ocean. You wouldn't see those beautiful things unless you bring them up to where there's sunlight and you can appreciate them. So why? Must be God wanted them that way. That's the reason they're that way. Anyway, we'll look at some of those things, Lord willing, in another lesson. This time we want to extend the Lord's invitation to those that are present this evening. Our great God wants a relationship with all of us that's good and right and that lasts for all eternity. And he's given us his word to reveal his love for us. The greatest example of his love is that he sent his only begotten son into the world to explain himself to us and to be a sacrifice and atonement for our sins to provide us a way to remove our sins and be in a right relationship with Him, be able to live with Him in eternity. 
You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be baptized. Jesus said, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he that disbelieves shall be condemned. If you're here this evening and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we want to encourage you to do so. It's together we